Last time on Plug Life Television, I drove my 2014 24 kilowatt hour short range Nissan Leaf called Busby over 250 miles from Edinburgh to the Isle of Skye for a week of exploring the island. Despite only having a range of 80 miles per charge, one of the shortest ranges of any electric vehicle, Busby managed the journey with no problems at all, and even finished rapid charging before we were ready to continue our journey. Busby made light work of exploring the Waternish and Duranish peninsulas in the northwest of Skye tackling the steep gradients as if they weren't there, and arriving home with plenty of charge to spare. So we ramped up the challenge and took on a 90 mile loop of the Trotternish Peninsula in the north. If Busby can do this sky road trip, so can any EV, and so can any one. And the best part is, we're only halfway through exploring this incredible island. We just need to make it back to the cottage first. We rejoin our story on the steep and challenging back road from Sky's capital, Portree, to our holiday cottage near Dunvegan. The challenge for Busby was unexpectedly made harder by the rapid charger in Portree being blocked by two abandoned cars. There was a slower destination charge point on the outskirts of town that we could have easily used to boost our range, but having weighed up my options, I decided to go for it and push Busby's limits further than I'd ever attempted to before. The steep climb to the peak of this hilly terrain had eaten up valuable range, and some unexpected obstructions thwarted my attempts to keep the momentum of the car going. Battery reserves were given a welcome respite as the back roads descended towards the coast. However, we joined the main road to Dunvegan at one of its most relentless uphill segments, and Busby was vocal in reminding us of the impact that this had on range. Very low battery charge. Search for nearest charging station. I kept a light throttle foot and a keen eye on battery charge as we counted down the remaining miles, hoping we'd done enough to make it back to the cottage. A bit too close for comfort that, but we made it. That was some of the most gentle throttle feathering I've done ever. And uh, it just shows you that Busby has made it and has outshone expectations. Actually, let's have a look at the total mileage for today. Bearing in mind we did take on 10 to 12% at Portree in the morning. We've covered 91 miles. So yeah, realistically, if we hadn't taken on that rapid charge at Portree, Busby would have been on for a, a real world 80 miles per charge, which is pretty much bang on what I'm, I'm used to. So uh, well done, Busby. But uh, whoever the uh, Tesla driver was, the Dutch Tesla driver, screw you in particular. When we woke up on day five, the fear had gone. Now that we had pushed Busby to its absolute limits and still made it home, we knew that we could go anywhere on sky. Which is just as well, because today's journey was a 90 mile round trip to the neighbouring island of Rassay, which has no charge points or, for that matter, petrol stations. We drove the back roads to Portree that had been tamed the day before, allowing us to take in the scenery without worrying about range. We arrived at the Portree Rapid Charger, now with both charging bays vacant, on 78% and topped up to 90% whilst chatting to a local B&B owner who was intrigued by the charging process, having been asked by many of their guests if they had their own charge point. From there we headed east on the A87. The rugged mountains that had formed the stunning blue backdrop of much of our trip so far were now within touching distance. After 13 miles we reached Sconcer, home to the ferry terminal for services to Rassay.
The smooth crossing was a leisurely 20 minutes or so and offered excellent panoramic views of the sound of Rasay as it was bathed in the morning sun. Rasay presented yet another interesting challenge for Busby. The island has no public charge points or petrol stations. The journey from the ferry terminal to the northern end of the island's road was a mere 10 miles, but we had a sneaking suspicion that it would be fun to explore and we couldn't wait to get started. Yeah, it didn't take us too long until we encountered our first distraction, Rasse's brand new distillery. In fact, it's so new that they can't even call their whiskey whiskey yet because it hasn't matured for long enough. In the meantime, they've got another distiller to produce While We Wait, a deliberate representation of what Rasse Distillery's whiskey is going to be like. Cheers! After that false start, we were now ready to drive to the north of Rasse. The start of the road took us through a lush and floral wooded section before the trees to the left gave way to the coast. A rocky hillside to the right was highly reminiscent of Heriana Rastaplas from our Elbil adventures in Norway the previous year, but the view to the left was unmistakably sky. The road eventually headed inland on a gentle ascent. On our way, we saw some of the micro-renewables that provide much of the island's power. As we approached Brockel, the gradients became more undulating and the road more tortuous, but nothing compared to what greeted us on Callum's Road, which was built by island resident Callum MacLeod between 1964 and 1974, using a shovel, a pick and a wheelbarrow. Tell you what Callum, you're some roadsmith. Scream if you want to go faster! The undulation on Callum's Road is unlike anything I'd encountered anywhere before, and wait, what on earth is that? Oh, we definitely need to stop to get a photo of that. Anyway, what followed was one and a half miles of roller coaster ride that offered up some terrifying blind summits that made you feel as if you were staring off the end of the world. The road had to come to an end eventually, so we continued our trek on foot, finally finding an excellent viewpoint to sit and look back across the Sound of Rasse to Sky. Having returned to the car, we got to tackle Callum's Road in reverse. Not only is it an impressive feat of DIY engineering, it's a miracle that any internal combustion engine vehicle can make it up these steep gradients. Busby, however, wasn't phased at all. If anything, I'm struggling more with these gradients than the car is. <laughs> it's worth sticking with this clip just to show you how steep the road actually was. I was nowhere near full throttle and our plucky electric car had plenty of power in reserve as it tackled gradients that would reduce any petrol or diesel car to screaming in first gear. On the way back, we stopped at Brockle and headed down the steep hillside to the castle ruins which overlook the Pebble Beach. We didn't find any treasure on this beach, but we did find the skeleton of a lolwut. Back on the main road, we were gifted with some glorious views of the mountains of sky as we headed towards the ferry terminal. En route, we stopped at Rasse Stores, plural, although there's only one on the island that I'm aware of, for ice cream, and Rasse Gallery, which also doubles as a B&B. The gallery is home to Gordon J. Cheap, who paints abstracts, landscapes and portraits, impressively specialising in entirely imaginary subjects for the latter. We'd travelled 35 miles since Bertree and arrived back at the ferry terminal on 51% state of charge. Having taken the ferry back to Sconser, we drove back along the A87 towards Portree. We stopped en route at Sligaken, home to the Quillen Brewery, a tiny little microbrewery that's bursting with charisma. The shop is no bigger than a porch, the entire brewing operations would fit into an average living room, and the staff give you a tour without even asking. They're clearly proud of what they do, and rightly so. Cheers, I'm loving filming this episode. Just across the road from the brewery is the old Sligaken Bridge, which has amassed multiple myths over the centuries and is a popular tourist attraction in itself. Our final stop of the day was the Aros Centre, just outside Portree, where we arrived on 36% state of charge. Aros is a cultural community hub featuring exhibitions, a cinema, galleries, workshops, live music and drama, a huge gift shop and, conveniently for us, a twin-headed Type 2 charge point. As with any charge place Scotland charge point, 
Using it was as simple as scanning an RFID card or selecting the charge point on the app. It transpired that the Aros Centre is a lot closer to Portree than it looks on the map, with the port being only a 20 minute walk away. We stocked up on gifts at Aros and spent an hour and a half exploring Portree Town Centre, arriving back to a car that was up to 82% state of charge, giving us a comfortable reserve to take the longer A850 route round the north of the island back to the cottage. A carefree throttle foot meant that we arrived back on 46%, equating to a projected full range of 69 miles, with 32 in reserve. Day 6 of our Sky Road trip took us to the Sleep Peninsula in the southeast of the island. This was by far the longest route on the island that we'd undertaken so far, 127 miles on paper, but with numerous detours that would add to this in reality. Provision and positioning of public charge points would be key to making this journey easy. We set off with a full battery and drove back the way we came to Sky along the A863 and then the A87 towards the mainland. Our first charging stop was the rapid charger at Broadford, which worked without any issues. Without anyone queuing to use it, we took full advantage of its presence, charging up to 95% to make sure that we had enough range to tackle sleet. Our next stop, just under 10 miles down the road, was Eileen Ironman, a hotel and gallery which overlooks the Isle of Ornsey. Part of the appeal of stopping here was its brand new Type 2 charge point, which we didn't need to use, but would provide a welcome boost in range whilst we explored the area. Unfortunately, the area has no phone signal and the charger was displaying an error message and refused to provide a charge. The hotel staff were exceptionally helpful trying to find the person who knows where the breaker switch for the charge point is to try and reset it, but after 15 minutes they were nowhere to be found. The hotel staff did, however, point us towards a brand new charge point that had just been installed down the road at the Ancroof Community Shop and Cafe. It turned out that Ancrove's new charge point was a bit better than we'd been expecting. Uh -huh. Oh, it's a rapid. That's good. Bowsers. This is a hub. Ancrove had just installed Sky's first charging hub, which in these parts means more than one charge point in the same location. The shop now boasts a 50 kilowatt triple headed rapid charger and a twin headed 22 kilowatt type 2 post. These charge points were so new that we were actually the first people to use them which earned me an appearance on the shop's Facebook page. Having taken on a mere 9%, charging up to 92% state of charge, we set off to explore the Sleep Peninsula. Our first stop, just three miles down the road, was another new distillery, the Torabig Distillery. Housed in a 200-year-old building constructed from stone from a nearby castle ruin, the distillery was opened in January 2017 and just like the Rasse distillery, is waiting on its own whisky maturing before it can go on sale. We headed south, hugging the coastline to Armadale, home to the ferry to Maleg on the mainland and a smashering of galleries. Having explored Armadale, we continued south towards the Aird of Sleet, the road narrowed and became single track, draped along undulating bluebell covered hills that offered pristine views of the mainland. The road ended at the Aird Old Church Gallery, which boasts excellent watercolours and jewellery. We got chatting to one of the friendly proprietors, Jane McDermott, who coincidentally was one of the first to comment on Ancrew's photo of us using their new chargers, having remembered our visit. Great to meet you, Jane. We continued south on foot sharing the footpath with various farm animals and taking in the views for another mile or so before turning back round to continue our loop of sleet. We drove back the way we came, past fields of bluebells and chicken glamping, before taking a left at Kilbeg and heading off the beaten path to the west of sleet. The single track road hugged the edge of Loch Dougal before snaking through the hills to the coast. Sleet's west coast has many bays that offer spectacular views of the islands, including at Achnacloich, 
The road continued north past Tarskovig, a small crofting village with cottages stippled across the rolling hills, onto our next beach stop at Tokovig. Our final beach stop was at Ord, nestled at the edge of Loch Eishort, with views across the water to the neighbouring Strathaird Peninsula. From there, the road cut back across Sleet to the main A851 road, where we headed back to Ancroof for a rapid charge to get us home. When we arrived at Ancroof on 53%, we were in for yet another surprise. A technician from Evolt, the manufacturers of these new charge points, was finishing the commissioning procedure at the site. But the technician in question, Graham, is based near Glasgow and just happens to be the chap who installed my own home charge point. Here we both were, 250 miles from home, at the exact same place, and the exact same time. What are the odds? We enjoyed a good catch-up and Graham gave me some useful tips for Evolt rapid chargers that will be the subject of a future episode. I also let Graham know about the faulty charge point just up the road, so it was a very productive chance encounter. Having charged to 85%, we drove back the way we came, with a familiar face in the rear view mirror. And Krug's new rapid charger meant that we didn't need to stop at Broadford for another charge, and we made the 49 mile journey back to the cottage on 22%. Day 7 didn't have the longest route of our sky holiday so far, but it was the first day in which we weren't going to pass any public charge points whatsoever. For our first stop on Day 7, we had to get up early to beat the tourist rush. Sky is home to many mythical landscapes, but the fairy pools are particularly popular with tourists. The waterfalls of the River Brittle have carved unique sculptures out of the rock, creating a series of pools with clear blue water. attract a surprising amount of tourists who are brave enough to jump into the cold water. Not all of them are human. This doggo was having a great time until he got stage fright from all the attention he was drawing. As we kept walking alongside the River Brittle, the number of fellow tourists dwindled, and we eventually found ourselves alone at the foot of some brutal, unforgiving and scree-covered mountains. We gazed up and contemplated the task ahead of us. And with that, we bid a hasty retreat back down the mountain and back to the car. The rest of our drive would take us northwest along the B8009 to Portnalong, taking in several stops along the way. First up was a spot of lunch at the shore of Loch Harport in Carbost, a village which is famous for being home to the only fully established whisky distillery in Skye, Talisker. The distillery was founded in 1830 and is globally renowned for its single malt whiskies. Each batch uses 29,000 litres of water, 175 litres of yeast, and takes 70 hours to ferment. Different varieties of whisky are matured in different types of cask to give them distinct flavours. Furthermore, whiskies matured in different types of cask are then sometimes mixed together to produce unique flavour combinations. Needless to say, we took some of those whiskies away with us. I'm not doing all three. We followed the main road up a steep S bend, briefly stopping off at the oyster shed where we saw a quagmire bug. We continued along the road to Portnalong Pier, passing another electromobile in the process and doing a gallery tour along the way. Joke time! It's a donut door. It's a jar. <laughs> our final stop was Portnalong Pier, our furthest destination from the cottage by road, but the closest as the crow flies. The weather was immaculate, as it had been throughout our stay, so we left the car and went for a walk through the fields and woodlands along the edge of the peninsula, taking in the landscapes and tranquillity that we'd become so fond of over the past week.
Despite having the shortest range of just about any EV on the market, Busby managed the entire day's driving on 63% of its battery, arriving back at the cottage with 37% to spare. That evening, we sat on the porch of the cottage, basking in the sun and reflecting upon the wonderful and unforgettable time we'd had on Sky. It only started raining when we had to leave Skye. Even in rainy weather, Skye provided us with stunning views on the way home, with low clouds draped across the mountains. After rapid charging at Broadford, we took a special detour down yet another beautiful winding single track road to the east of the island to catch the Calrea to Glenelg Ferry, which makes the crossing at the closest point between Skye and the mainland. This unique old ferry, the Glenachulish, is the last manually operated turntable ferry remaining in Scotland. A couple of old sea dogs live on the ferry, greeting passengers and trying to play tug of war with the rope when the ferry is being moored. The process of being pivoted round gave us panoramic views of Kyle Rea and one last look at Sky before the ferry went on its way. Back on the mainland, we drove a gradual but seemingly never-ending incline to the top of the mountains, stopping off at the Bailach Rattigan viewpoint. From there we drove the steep three-mile descent to the A87. The road was so steep that at points we were regenerating 30 kilowatts back into the battery, almost as quick as rapid charging, while still gathering momentum. We rolled into Shield Shop, having regenerated 5% back into the battery, and hooked up to the rapid charger to begin our journey back the way we came. As for range anxiety? <laughs> What's range anxiety? <laughs> 